Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today I'm going to be taking a look at a quick revision of Act 1, Scene 3 of Macbeth. So this is the scene where Shakespeare finally decides to allow us to meet Macbeth. Um, we've been told about him in Act 1, Scene 2 by the captain. He was alluded to in Act 1, Scene 1 by the witches. And yet, Act 1, Scene 3 doesn't begin with Macbeth, it begins again with the witches. And we have to consider what the effect of that is and why Shakespeare decided to do it. The witches conform to Jacobean stereotypes of witches, with the second witch, for example, saying that she's been off killing swine. And uh, this was a commonly held belief that witches were responsible for the death of domestic animals. So the audience is immediately reminded of the profound evil of the witches. They're conforming to expectations, engaging in evil acts and petty acts. Uh, this pettiness is particularly evident in the account that the first witch gives of her response to being denied chestnuts by a sailor's wife. She torments the sailor as a result of this and spends a good 20 lines essentially detailing the nature of the tortures that are meted out to him. The long-awaited arrival of Macbeth in the play is finally realised when he utters the words, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. These are particularly telling words, and Shakespeare's obviously thought long and hard about how to introduce the character, most notably because they echo the words of the witches from Act 1, Scene 1, Fair is foul and foul is fair. This creates a parallel between Macbeth and the witches, and given that this scene has already established or re-established how evil the witches are, creating that link between Macbeth and the witches suggests to the audience that Macbeth is himself evil in some way. This concept could be complemented by the use of the oxymoron, so foul and fair. Um, how can something be foul and fair, good and bad? Um, something seems distinctly wrong about this, and that wrongness could be, again, that aspect of the character of Macbeth that the audience is first introduced to. There seems to be something wrong about Macbeth because he's associated with the witches. And also, it feeds into this idea of there seeming to be something wrong in that Macbeth is presented as both evil through his association with the witches and good and noble, given what the captain said about him in Act 1, Scene 2. This oxymoron provides interesting opportunities for directors. How can Macbeth be describing the day as both foul and fair? Um, one possibility is that the foul aspect is the terrible weather. If we're going with the kind of pathetic fallacy that's been used previously, then this is a stormy, windy, terrible day, and therefore foul. And yet fair, because he's just won this really important battle. Conversely, some productions actually present the weather at this point as fair, as beautiful, as sunny, and therefore the foul aspect is the carnage that's been produced. Personally, I favour the former. Um, it seems to be consistent to keep the weather in this terrible vein. Following the events of Act 2, Scene 2, the claim from the second witch that Macbeth will be Fane of Cawdor should come as no surprise to the audience. Therefore, we have some dramatic irony. Not only is Macbeth Fane of Glam's, as he well knows, but the audience also knows that he's Fane of Cawdor. What Banquo is confused about is Macbeth's reaction. Why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? If he's being rewarded with honours like Fane of Cawdor and the witches predict that he will be king in the future, why on earth should be, he be afraid? And what this seems to be is Shakespeare suggesting that Macbeth has already got the murder of Duncan in mind, even if it's at a very subconscious level. There's no reason to start, to be startled, or to fear something unless you know that there's something evil associated with that, like the idea that to become king, he would have to kill the king. When Banquo asks the witches to offer a prophecy for him, they suggest that he's lesser than Macbeth and greater, not so happy, yet much happier, and that he shalt get kings, though thou be none. So there's a huge contrast that's being presented between Banquo and Macbeth. A lot of these are based around oxymorons. How on earth can Banquo be lesser and greater? How can he be not so happy yet happier? 
and straight away because an oxymoron's used you get a sense of strangeness that there's something wrong here complementing the uh, issues with the witches and their wrongness themselves there is something decidedly strange and mysterious about this but also it helps to present Bancro as a foil to Macbeth he is both lesser and greater than Macbeth he is not so happy and happier and we have to kind of unpick through the narrative of the play how that can be the case but we've already seen that Bancro and Macbeth react very differently to the witches um, and it's those differences between them that help us to understand both sets of characters it could be argued that uh, Bancro is lesser and not so happy than Macbeth because he doesn't get to become king but equally he could be greater and happier because he has the moral high ground um, he's not going to be tormented in hell for his crime of regicide and the final uh, claim about it that um, he shall get kings though thou be none well he's not going to become king once again but historically the claim is that uh, Banquo was the father to the line of Stuart kings that traced its line right down to James the first the supernatural nature of the witches is evident in their means of departure they seem to just vanish as if they were bubbles hence the earth hath bubbles as the water has but one of the things that's interesting about this is the different reactions of Banquo and Macbeth to that disappearance once again with Banquo potentially acting as a foil uh, Banquo it just seems surprised whither are they vanished he asks while Macbeth says would they had stayed he wishes to learn more he's fascinated by them upon learning from Ross that Macbeth has been made the Fane of Cawdor Banquo is immediately horrified he states what can the devil speak true up until this point he's been quite dismissive of the witches but now that their prophetic words seem to hold some truth his horror is articulated because of the apparently hellish origins again the contrast between the reactions of Banquo and those of Macbeth are really striking rather than the horror of Banquo Macbeth becomes reflective and in an aside so with other characters on stage but so that um, only the audience can hear he reflects Glam's and Fane of Cawdor the greatest is behind in other words the greatest of the most significant of the prophecies is next to come that of being king while Shakespeare illustrates the hope and ambition of Macbeth in the face of these prophecies Banquo as his foil is once again reflective and skeptical he says to win us to our harm the instruments of darkness tell us truths win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence in other words they tell us one thing that proves to be true that's believable only so that we then follow a path that will lead to a dark end some kind of destruction once again Macbeth uh, gives us information in the form of an aside um, a convention of the Jacobean theatre was that anything that's revealed in an aside or a soliloquy is a revelation of the truth so we know that this is exactly what Macbeth genuinely feels as a character so two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme clearly the two happy prologues are being Glams and Cawdor and the swelling act of the imperial theme is the idea of being king this is something that he rejoices in something that he finds great relish in hence swelling the supernatural soliciting that Macbeth refers to is the kind of prompting and stimulus of the witches in making this prophecy but it's interesting that he says that it cannot be ill cannot be good once again we've got a form of parallelism which seems to echo fair is foul and foul is fair there seems to be a kind of moral ambiguity here or moral uncertainty he goes on to unpick it uh, if ill why if it give me earnest of success commencing in a truth in other words how can this be bad if it's actually based on reality if it's actually based on truth he is fain of Cawdor but then on the flip side if it's good why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth fix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs in other words why does it make me think about committing murder so it's having a profound effect on him this isn't something that he takes lightly it's something that disturbs him profoundly it makes his hair stand on end and fix my hair and makes his heart beat rapidly my seated heart knock at my ribs 
because it is unnatural. It would disturb the great chain of being. It's the worst possible act that anybody could commit to commit regicide. So he is appalled by it. But having said that, he is still thinking about it. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My fault whose murder yet is but fantastical shakes, and so on. Um, these are things that are in his head. And for most of us, hopefully, when we hear that there's a possibility that there's some kind of honour that's available in the future, we don't think, oh yeah, I'll just uh, murder someone in order to get it. This is something that's at the back of Macbeth's mind. And even though he wants to reject it, and thinks that the idea of murder is just a fantasy, just something that um, isn't really a reality or a possible uh, route to go down, it is still there. It is part of him. So when we consider whether the witches are, you know, totally to blame for the murder of Duncan, or whether it's Lady Macbeth, we've got to remember that Shakespeare presents us with a man for whom this is a possibility. It's interesting that Macbeth claims that his ability to act, his function, is smothered in surmise. That violent verb, smothered, something associated with death, is enabled by procrastination, by thinking. By considering the act of murder, it stops the act of murder. And this is a theme that's uh, returned to time and time again over the course of the play, um, something that increasingly Macbeth rejects as the play progresses. Um, his actions are no longer cooled by thought um, as we move into the second act, but at this stage he is saying that his consideration of what he's proposing is stopping, stopping him actually doing it, acting on it. As a result, Macbeth reaches the sensible conclusion, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. In other words, if fate wants him to be king, it will make him king without him having to act, without my stir. This idea is echoed once again in the final aside of the scene, when Macbeth says, come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. In other words, what will be will be. Uh, time will pass quickly through even the most difficult days. Um, it's interesting that he concludes with this because very soon when an obstacle presents itself, he turns to the idea of murder very quickly. As soon as the Prince of Cumberland is appointed above him, he thinks again of the witches and what he may have to do. Okay, tough.